and Interval by David Foster Wallace. Both house director Pat Montesian and Don Gatley's AA sponsor like to remind him how the new Ennett House resident Joffrey Day could be an invaluable teacher for him, Gatley, as staff. So then, at 46 years of age, I came here to learn to live by cliches, is what Day says to Charlotte Treat right after Randy Lenz asked what time it was at 8.25. To turn my will and life over to the care of cliches, one day at a time, easy does it. First things first, ask for help. Thy will not mine be done. It works if you work it. Grow or go. Keep coming back. Poor old Charlotte Treat, needle pointing primly beside him on the old vinyl couch that just came from Goodwill, purses her lips. You need to ask for some gratitude. Oh no, but the point is that I've already been fortunate enough to receive gratitude. Day crosses one leg over the other in a way that inclines his whole little soft body toward her, for which, believe you, me, I'm grateful. I cultivate gratitude. That's part of the system of cliches I'm here to live by. An attitude of gratitude. A grateful drunk will never drink. I know the actual cliche is, a grateful heart will never drink. But since organs can't properly be said to imbile, and I'm still afflicted with just enough self-will to decline to live by utter non-sequiturs as opposed to just good old cliches, I'm taking the doubtless hazardous liberty of light amendment. I'll bet grateful amendment, of course. Charlotte Treats looks over to Gately for some sort of help or staff enforcement of dogma. The poor bitch is clueless. All of them are clueless. Still, Gately reminds himself that he too is probably still mostly clueless, even after all these hundreds of days. I didn't know that I didn't know is another of these slogans that look so shallow for a while, and then all of a sudden drop off and deepen like the lobster waters off the north shore. As Gately fidgets his way through daily AM meditation, he always tries to remind himself daily that this is all an Ennett House residency is supposed to do. Buy these poor Utes some time, some thin pie slice of abstinent time, till they can start to get a whiff of what's true and deep, almost magic, under the shallow surface of what they're trying to do. I cultivate it assiduously. I do special gratitude exercises at night up there in the room. Gratitude ups, you could call them. Ask Randy over there if I don't do them like clockwork, diligently, Sedu sedulously. Well, it's true is all, treats sniffs, about gratitude. Everybody except Gatley, who's lying on the, on the old other couch opposite them, is ignoring this exchange, watching an old movie whose tracking is a little messed up so that st staticky stripes eat at the picture's bottom and top. The Ennett House director, Pat M., encourages new staff to think of residents like they'd like to bludgeon to death as teachers of patience, tolerance, self-discipline, and restraint. She can always tell when Gatley's exercising tolerant restraint because of the slight facial tick that betrays his efforts of will and makes it a point to praise his intelligence to grow and change when the cheek starts to spasm. Day isn't done. One of these exercises is being grateful that life is so much easier now. I used to sometimes think. I used to think in long compound sentences with subordinate clauses and even the old polysyllable. Now I find I needn't. Now I live by the dictates of macrum samplers ordered from the back page ad of an old reader's digest or Saturday evening post. Easy does it. Remember to remember, but for the grace of God, turn it over, terse, hard-boiled, good old Norman Rockwell, Paul Harvey wisdom. I walk around with my arms out straight in front of me and recite these cliches in a monotone, no inflection necessary. Could that be one? Could that be added to the cliche pool? No inflection necessary? Too many syllables? Probably. Poor old Charlotte Treat. All of nine weeks clean is looking primmer and primmer, 
She glances again over at Gatley, lying on his back, taking up the living room's whole other sofa. One sneaker up on the sofa's square-worn fabric arm, his eyes almost closed. Only house staff get to lie on the couches. Denial, Charlotte finally says. It's not a river in Egypt. How about the both of you shut the fuck up, says Emily Minty. Emile Minty. Joffrey. Not, not, not Joff, Joffrey. Day has been at Ennett House's eight days. He came in from Roxbury's infamous Democ Detox, where he was the only white person, which Gatley bets must have been broadening for him. Day has a squished, blank, smeared, flat face, one requiring, one requiring great effort to like, and eyes that are just starting to lose the necessitated glaze of early sobriety. Gately tries to remind himself that Day is a newcomer and still very raw, a red wine and a quaalude man who finally nodded out in late October and put his sob through the window, through his put his sob through the window of a Malden sporting goods store, and then got out and proceeded to browse until Boston's finest came and got him. He taught something horseshit sounding like social historicity or historical sociality at some junior college up the expressway in Medford, and came in saying in his intake interview that he also manned the helm of a scholarly quarterly. Word for word, the house manager had said, Man the helm, and scholarly quarterly. His intake indicated that Dade had been in and out of a blackout for most of the last several years, and his wiring is still, as they say, pretty frayed. His detox at Dimock, where they barely had the resources to slip you a librium if you start to DT, must have been real grim, because Joffrey D. now alleges it never happened. His story is he just strolled into Ennett House on a lark one day from his home five-plus miles away in Malden and found the place too hilariously egregious to want to leave. It's the, news, it's the newcomers with some education that are the worst, according to staffer Eugenio M. They identify their whole selves with their head, and the disease makes it command headquarters in the head. Day wears chinos of indeterminate hue, brown socks with black shoes and shirts that the house manager had described on the intake form as East European type turtleneck shirts. Days now on the vinyl couch with Charlotte Treat after breakup in the Emmett House living room with a few of the other residents who either aren't working or don't have to be at work early and with Gatley who pulled the night shift down in the front office till 0400 then got temp relieved by Jeanette Fultz so he could go to work down at the Shatuk shelter till 0700 and then came and hauled ass back up and took back over so Jeanette F. could go off to her N.A. convention thing with a bunch of N.A. kids and what looked like a Volkswagen bus with a hood over the engine and is now... Gatley covering Jeanette's half of the day shift until somebody else gets here and is trying to unclench and center himself inside by tracing the cracks in the paint of the living room ceiling with his eyes. Gatley often feels a terrible sense of loss, narcotics-wise, in the AM. So even after all of, his, all of this drug-free time, his AA sponsor over at the White Flag Group says some people never get over the loss of what they thought was one of their true best friends and lover. They just have to pray daily for acceptance and patience and the brass danglers to move forward through the grief and loss, to wait for time to harden the scab. The sponsors doesn't give Gatley one bit of shit for feeling bad. On the contrary, he commands Gatley for his candor and breaking down and crying like a baby and finally telling him about it 1 a.m., the sense of terrible loss. It's a myth no one misses it. Their particular substance. Their particular substance. Shit, you wouldn't need to give it up if you didn't miss it. You just have to turn it over. The emptiness and loss. Keep coming, show up, pray, ask for help. 
Gately rubs his eyes. Simple advice like this does seem does seem like a lot of cliches. Day's right about how it seems. Yes, and if Joffrey Day keeps on steering by the way things seem to him, he's a dead man, sure. Gately's already watched dozens come through here and leave early, and some of them die. If Day ever gets lucky and breaks down, finally, and comes to the office late at night to clutch his paint cuff and blubber and beg for help, Gately get to tell Day that he cliched directives of recovery are a lot more deep and hard to actually do. To try and live by instead of just say, but he'll he'll only get to say if it, it he'll only get to say it if Day comes and asks. Personally, Gately gives Day like a month at the outside before he's back tipping his hat to parking meters. Except who is Gately the judge? Who'll end up getting the gift of program V who won't? He needs to remember. He tries to feel like Day is teaching him patience. It takes great patience and tolerance not to want to punt the guy out into Commonwealth Ave and open up his bunk to somebody that really wants it, desperately, the gift. Except who is Gately to think he can know who wants it and who doesn't, deep down. Gately's arm is behind his head, up against the sofa's other arm. The VCR is on something violent Gately neither sees nor hears. He can sort of turn his attention on and off like a light. Even when he was a resident here, he had this pro housebreaker's ability to screen input, to do sensory triage. It was one reason he'd be able to stick out his nine residential months with 21 other newly detox, detox housebreakers, hoods, whores, fired execs, subway musicians, beer bloated construction workers, vagrants, cirrhotic car salesmen, Bunko artists, mincing pillow biters, North End hard guys, Avon ladies, pimply kids with nose rings, denial-ridden housewives, and etc. All jonesing and head gaming and desperate and grieving and basically whacked out and producing non-stopping output 24-7. At some point in here, Day says, so bring on the lobotomist. Bring him in. Bring him on, I say. Except... Gately's counselor when he was a resident here, Eugenio Martinez, one of the volunteer alumni counselors, a one-eyed, a one-eared former boiler room bunko man, now a cellular phone retailer who'd gone through the house under the original prepat founder, and now had been, now had about ten years clean. Eugenio M had lovingly confronted Gately early on about a special burglar selective attention and about how it could be dangerous. Because how can you be sure it's you doing the input screening and not the spider? Eugenio had called addiction the spider instead of the disease and dispenses advice in terms of like, for example, feeding the spider versus starving the spider and so on. He called Gatley into the house manager's back office and said, what if screening his attention input turned out to be feeding the spider? And what about an experimental unscreening of input for a while and Gately has said he'll do his best to try and had come back out and tried to watch his Celtics game while two resident pillow biters from the from off the Fenway were on the couch having this involved conversation about some third fag having to go in and get the skeleton of some kind of fucking rodent removed from the inside his butthole the unscreening experiment had lasted half an hour this was right before Gatley got his 90-day chip and wasn't exactly right, wrapped real tight, still. And at house this year is nothing like the freak show it was when Gatley went through. Gatley has been substance-free for 421 days today. Charlotte Treat, with her carefully made-up ruined face, is watching the st static strip movie on the VCR while she, needless while she needle points something. Conversation between her and Joffrey D has mercifully petered out. Day is scanning the room for somebody else to engage and piss off so he can prove to himself he doesn't fit in here and stay separated off, isolated inside himself, and maybe get them so pissed off there's a beef and he gets bounced out. Day, and it won't be his fault. You can almost hear the spider of the disease chewing away inside his head. 
Emil Minty, Randy Lenz, and Bruce Green are also in the room, sprawled in spring shot chairs, lighting one gasper off the end of the last. Their posture, the don't fuck with me slouch of the streets, that here makes their body's texture somehow hard to distinguish from that of the chairs. Nell Gunther is sitting at the long table in the doorless dining room that opens out right off the old donated VCR and monitors pine stand, whitening under her nails with a manicure pencil amid the remains of something she's eaten that involved serious syrup. Joe S. is also there, way down by himself at the table's far end, trying to saw at a waffle with a knife and fork attached to the stumps of his wrist with Velcro bands. A long ago former CPA, Joe Smith is 45 and looks 70, has almost all white hair that's waxy and yellow from close order smoke and finally got into Emmett House, Emmett House last month after a summer in the Cambridge City shelter. Joe S. is making his 50th odd stab at some kind of durable sobriety in AA once devoutly RC. He's been he's had a crippling trouble with faith in a loving God ever since the RC church apparently granted his wife an annulment in 91 after years of marriage. Then for several years a ro a, ro a rooming house drunk, which in Gately's view is like one step up from a homeless person type drunk. Joe S. got jumped and rolled and beaten half to death in Cambridge in the storm on Xmas Eve of last year and left to freeze in an alley and ended up losing his hands and feet. Whenever residents Dooney Glenn and Wade McDade are together in a room and Joe S. comes teetering in on his blocky prosthetic shoes. G and Mc McD will stand up and shout together, Hail Joe, asleep in the snow. Repeated threats of restriction and worse have not broken them off this practice. Dooney Glenn's also been observed telling Joe Smith that things like that, there's some new guy coming in and moving into the disabled room with Joe who's totally minus arms or legs, or even a head, and communicates by farting in Morse code, which Sally earned Glenn three days full house restriction and a week's extra house chore for what Jeanette Foltz described in the staff log as exiv cruelty. There is a vague intestinal moaning in Gately's right side. Watching Joe Smith smoke a Benson and Hedges by holding it between his stump with his elbows out like a man with Pruning shears is an adventure in fucking pathos, as far as Gately's concerned. And forget about what it's like trying to watch Joe S. try to light a match. Gately, who's been on live-in staff here for months now, believes Charlotte Treat's devotion to needlepoint is suspect. All those needles, in and out of all that thin, sterile white cotton stretch, drum tight in its round frame, the needle makes a kind of thud and squeak when it goes in the cloth, it's not much like the soundless pop and slide of a real cook, cook and shoot, but still, she takes such great care. Gately wonders what color he'd call the ceiling if forced to call it a color. It's not beige and it's not gray. The brown yellow tones are from high tar gaspers. A pall hangs up near the ceiling, even this early in the new sober day. Some of the drunks and tank Trank jockeys stay up most of the night, jogging their feet and chain smoking, even though there's no movies or music allowed after midnight. Don G has that odd house staffer's knack already after four months of seeing everything significant in both living and dining rooms without really looking. Emil Minty, a hardcore smack attic punk, here for reasons nobody can quite yet pin down, is an old mustard colored easy chair with his combat boots up on the, on one of the standing ashtrays, which is tilting not quite enough for Gatley to tell him to watch out, please. Minty's orange mohawk and the shaved skull around it are starting to grow out brown, which is just not a pleasant sight in the morning at all. The other ashtray on the floor by his chair is full of the ragged new moons of bitten nails, which has got to mean that Esther Thrale, who Gately ordered a bed, who, who Gately ordered to bed at 0230 was black down here in the was back down here in the chair having at her nails again the second Gately who left to go mop out mop up shit 
at the Shatak shelter. Another gurgle and an abdominal shrug. When he's up all night, Gately's stomach gets all acidy and tight from either the coffee, maybe, or just to staying up. Amel M's been sleeping in the street since he's since he was maybe 16. Gately can tell. He's got that suited complexion homeless guys have where the suit has insinated itself into the dermal layer. And the big arm driver for Leisure Time Ice, the quiet kid, Bruce Green, a garbage head, all substance type kid, maybe 21, face very, sm very slightly smunched in one side where sleeveless khaki shirts used to live in a trailer in that apocalyptic Enfield trailer park out near Alston. Gately likes Green because he seems to have sense enough to keep his yap shut when he's got nothing important to say, which is basically all the time. The tattoo on the kid's right tricep is a spear-pierced heart over the hideous name Mildred Bonk, who Bruce G. told him was a ray of living light and a dead ringer for the late lead singer of The Fiends in Human Shape and his dead heart's one lover ever, and, and his dead heart's one love ever, and who took their daughter and left him this summer for some guy who told her he ranched fucking Longhorn Cow east of Atlantic City, New Jersey. He's got, even by Ennett House standards, major league sleep trouble. Green and he and Gately play cribbage sometimes in the wee dead hours, a game Gately picked up in jail. Joe S. is now hunched in a meaty coughing fit, his elbows out and forehand, forehead purple. Gately can see everything without moving his eyes at all. And then Lenz. Randy Lenz is a small-time organic coke dealer who wears sport, court, sport coats rolled up over his big forearms and is always checking his pulse on the inside of his wrist. It comes out that Lenz is of keen interest to both sides of the law. This past May, he'd apparently all of a sudden lost all control and holed up in a Charlestown motel and freebased most of a whole hundred grams he'd been fronted by a suspiciously trusting Brazilian in what Lenz didn't know was supposed to have been a DEA sting operation in the South End. Having screwed both sides in what Gately secretly views as a delicious fuck-up, Randy Lenz has, since May, been the most wanted he's probably ever been. He is seedily handsome in the way of pimps and low-level coke dealers, muscular in the way certain guys' muscles look muscular but can't really lift anything, with complexly gelled hair and the little bird-like head movements of the deeply vein. One forearm's hair has a little hairless patch, which Gately knows all too well spells knife owner. And if there's one thing Gately's never been able to stomach, it's a knife owner. Little swaggery guys who always queer a square beef and come off the ground with a blade so you have to get cut and take it from them. Lenz is teaching Gately a restrained compassion for people you pretty much want to beat up on sight. And it's obvious to everybody except Pat Montesian, whose odd gullibility and the presence of human sludge, though, Gately needs to try to remember was one of the reasons why he he himself had to why he himself had got into Ennett House. That lens is here is mostly just a hide. He rarely leaves the house except under compulsion, avoids all windows and travels nightly to the required AA and NA meetings in a disguise that makes him look like Cesar Romero after a terrible accident. And then he always wants to walk home solo afterward which is not encouraged. Len's leg never stops joggling. Day claims it joggles even worse in sleep. Lenz is seated low in the northeasternmost corner of an old fake velour love seat that he's jammed in the northeast corner of the living room. Randy Lenz has a strange compulsive need to be north of everything, and possibly even northeast of everything, and Gately has no clue what it's about but observes Lem's, Lenz's position routinely for his own interest in files. House director Pat M. is due in at 0900, and his application interviews with three people, 2F and 1M, who'd better be showing up soon, 
And Gately will get up and answer the door when they don't know enough to just come in and will say, Welcome, and get them a cup of coffee he, if he judges them to be able to hold it. He'll take them aside and tip them off to be sure to pet M's dog. And during the interview, the dog will be sprawled all over the front office, sides heaving, writhing, and biting at themselves. He'll tell the applicants it's a proof fact that if Pat's dog likes you, you're in. Pat M has directed Gately to tell applicants this. And if they do actually pet the dog, two hideous white golden retrievers with se separating skin afflictions, plus one has grand melepsy, it'll betray a level of desperate willingness that Pat says is just about all she goes by deciding. A nameless cat oozes by on the broad windowsill above the back of the fabric couch. Animals here come and go. Graduates adopt them or they just disappear. Their fleas tend to remain. Gately's intestines gurgle. Boston's dawn this morning was chemically pink. The nail pairings in the ashtray on the floor are, he says, way too big to be fingernail bits. These bitten arcs are broad and thick and a deep autumnal yellow. They are not f f from fingers. He swallows hard. Gately, tell Day how even if they are just cliches, cliches are A, soothing, and B, proclaim a common sort of common sense, and C, license the universal assent that drowns out silence. And fourth, silence is deadly, pure spider food. If you've got the disease, the old white flaggers say you can spell the disease dis ease, which sums up the basic situation up nicely. Gately should probably also tell him that the only real ultimate relief from the disease is God, as, is in, as in finding and cultivating some kind of personally comfortable and worshipable higher power. But Gately still can't bring himself to say this kind of thing out loud. Pat has a meeting at the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services and Government Center at noon she needs to be reminded about, since she can't read her own handwriting. Gately envisions going around having to find out who's been biting their fucking toenails in the living room and putting the disgusting toenail bits in the ashtray at like 0500. House regs prohibit bare feet any place downstairs. There's a pale brown water stain on the ceiling over day and tree the exact shape of Florida. Randy Lenz has issues with Joffrey Day because Day is educated and a teacher and a man and man's a journal helm. This threatens the concept of Lenz, who sees himself as a kind of hipply sexy artist, dash intellectual, small time dealers never think of themselves as just small time dealers. For occupation on his intake form, Lenz had put freelance writer. And he makes a big show of the fact he reads. For his, first, for his first sober week here in August, he sat all day smoking and joggling in the northeast corner of the living room, holding open a gigantic medical dictionary and pretending to be reading medical words until Glenn and McDade started busting his balls about never turning the page, at which juncture he quit reading and started talking, making everybody nostalgic for when he just read... <laughs> Jeanette F. had put in the September log that Lenz would, quote, get on your very last nerve, which Gately had underlined in a different color ink. Plus, Joffrey D. has issues with Randy L. too. The dislike is mutual. There's a certain way they don't like look at each other. And so now, of course, they're mashed in together in the tiny three-room bedroom. Since last week, three guys in one night missed curfew and came in without one normal-sized pupil between them and all refused urines and got discharged on the spot. And so Day got moved up in his first week from five-man newcomer's room to the three-man. Seniority comes quick around here. Lens and Day, a beef may be brewing. Dale try to goad Lenz into a beef that'll be public enough so that he doesn't get hurt, but does get bounced out. And then he can leave treatment and go back to Chianti and Ludes and make out like the relapse is in its house and never have to confront himself or his disease. 
To Gately, Joffrey D. is like a wide-open textbook on the disease. One of Gately's job is to keep an eye on what's possibly brewing among residents and let Pat or the house manager know and try to smooth things down in advance if possible. The ceiling's color could be called done if forced. Someone has farted. No one knows who. But this isn't like a normal adult place where everybody coolly pretends a fart didn't happen. Here, everybody has to make their little comment. Time is passing. Ennett House reeks of passing time. It is the humidity of early sobriety hanging and palpable. You can hear ticking in clockless rooms here. Gately changes the angle of one sneaker, puts on his puts his other arm behind his head. His head has real weight and pressure. Randy Lenz's obsess obsessive compulsions include the need to be north, a fear of discs, a tendency to make his own pulse, a pathological fear of every form of timepiece, and a constant need to know the time with great precision. Day, man. You get the time, maybe real quick. Lens. For the third time in half an hour. Patience, tolerance, reserve, compassion. Gately remembers his own first few straight months here. He felt the sharp edge of every second that went by. And the freak show dreams. Nightmares beyond the worst DTs you'd ever heard of. One reason to have a nice shift staffer down in the front office is so somebody is there for the residents to talk to, talk to at when, not if, when, when the detox nightmares ratchet them out out of twisted sheets at like 0300. Nightmares about relapsing and getting high, about not getting high, but having everybody think you're high, about getting high with your alcoholic mom and then killing her with a baseball bat. Whipping it out for a court-ordered urine and starting up and flames come shooting out. Getting high and bursting into flames. Having a water sprout shaped like an enormous syringe suck you up inside. A vehicle explodes in a bloom of enhanced flame on the VCR. It's hood up like an old pop tab. Day is making a broad gesture out of checking his wristwatch. Right around 8.30, fella. Randy L's fine nostrils flare and whiten. He stares straight ahead, eyes narrowed, fingers on his wrist. Day purses his lips. Gately hangs his head over the arm of the sofa and regards lens upside down. That look on your face means something there, Randy. Are you, like, communicating with that look? Does anybody know that the time a little more exactly is what I'm wondering, Don says, since Day doesn't. Gately checks his own cheap digital head still hung over the arm sofa. I got 8.32 and 14, 15, 16 seconds, Randy. Thanks a lot, DG man. And now Day has some flared, narrow look for Lens. We've been over this, friend, amigo, sport. You do this all the time with me. Again, I'll say it. I don't have a digital watch. This is a fine old antique watch. It points. A memento of vastly better days. It's not a digital watch. It's not a cesium-based atomic watch. It points with hands. See? Spiro, Agnew, here has little two little arms. They point. They suggest. It's not a fucking stopwatch for life. Lens, get a watch. Am I right? Why don't you just get a watch, Lens? Three people I happen to know of for a fact have offered you to get a watch. And let you pay them back whenever you feel comfortable about poking your nose out and investigating the work world. Get a watch. Obtain a watch. A fine, digital, incredible, wide watch. About five times the width of your wrist. So you have to hold it like a falconer. And it treats time like pie. Easy does it, Charlotte. Tr treat half sinks. Not looking up for her needle and frame. Day looks around at her. I don't believe I was speaking to you in any way shape or form. Peace, Gatley says softly, his head still hanging over. Joe Smith upside down is having another coughing fit over in the dining room. Lens is staring blackly at Joffrey Day. If you're trying to fuck with me, brother, he shakes his head. He shakes his fine head, his fine shiny head. Big mistake. Day puts his head, Day puts his hands up to his cheeks. Ooh, 
I'm all a tremble. I can barely hold my arm steady to read my watch. Lens points his cigarette. Big, 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 real big mistake. Emil M's contorted way forward in his chair in the way of somebody communicating that he's trying to watch TV around a distraction. How's about I give you both a beating if you don't shut up? A time-killing fantasy Gately has lately is in the middle of bullshit squabbles like this. He all of a sudden picks Joffrey D up bodily and swings him by his dress shoes and uses him as a bludgeon to beat Randy Lenz over a groomed head end, freeing up two bunks at once. His progress consists of just entertaining such thoughts now instead of acting on them, which Pat M reassures him is almost the same as patience. The Ennett House living room has no clock. Gately likes that his cheap watch counts off the seconds. Sometimes he just sits and watches the seconds on his big wrist tick digitally off to remind himself that an interval of time is passing, will pass. Day has crossed his legs and laced his hands over the knee, a posture they all know lends the tests for some reason. So let me get this straight. We're engaged in an argument about whether it's appropriate for you to continually to harass innocent watch wearers for the exact time in lieu of buying your own watch, and you win the argument by claiming that my argument is an attempt to quote, fuck with you, and by threatening me with physical harm if I don't acquiesce to your argument. This, to you, is winning. Len says, I ain't got time for this shit. Charlotte Treat slaps at her needless frame to indicate she's exasperated. He didn't threaten you. Emil Minty suddenly stands, making the ashtray topple. I'm fucking serious. Gately twists on the couch to catch Minty eyes to catch Minty's eyes. Past Minty down at the dining room table's end. Joe S is still coughing, still hunched over his desk. A, a dusky purple and Nell Gunther is behind him, pounding him on the back so hard that it keeps sending him forward over his ashtray. And he waves one step vaguely over his shoulder to signal her to quit. Gately locks eyes with Minty until the kids sit back down, running a hand over his mohawk and warily asking when he can get the fuck out of here. I'm just trying to clear on what's being said here, Day is saying. Only a couple months ago, Gately would have stood up and stood over Minty and physically intimidated him to get him to sit down. Charlotte T is trying to catch Gately's eyes as Len sits there joggling and telling Day all he's saying is Day better hope to Christ he doesn't make Lenz have to get up out of his chair right there. Minty is making no move to start cleaning up the ashtray's mess. Gately has no idea where he'll live or what he'll do when his term as a life live-in staff is over. Day joggles his own foot and asks Gatley for his feedback on what's transpiring here. Whether staff can confirm hearing a, how shall we say, he says, menacing aspect to Lenz's tone and are content. Joe Smith's coughs have taken on your serious cougher's deep, slow, searching aspect, like he's trying to pronounce something. Easy does it. Shrieks Treat, holding out her absurdly tiny needle, brandishing it. Peace on earth will, peace on earth, good will toward men. Peace on earth, good will toward men, says Gately, back all the way on his back, smiling up the cracked down ceiling, not even a hint of a tick to betray anything, but a tolerant willingness to let it all pass for the moment, to work itself out. Seek its own level, settle, blow over, die of neglect. He's pretty sure he knows who farted.